So here we have a typical contemporary footballer who is gone for it with the ink and the mohawk, which is sort of like completely like very road warrior, it's very ferocious, because the thing you have to remember with these footballers is their lives are totally controlled. Like get in the training, get on the bus, do this, do that. So they have two ways that they can rebel. Well, actually they have more, but two ways that are to do with style. And one is hair and one is ink. And this is a player who plays, actually he's, he was on the Belgian team. I thought this is a great, slide to start with because this guy is so iconic and so great and he's on the Belgian team at the World Cup and then he got dropped yesterday I think <laughs> so anyway his name's Nain Golan I don't know about a bit of a dodgy pronunciation but he's really great but we're now we're going to go back this is where the screen goes all wobbly ready so <laughs> This is one of the great folk heroes of British football. This is a guy called Nobby Styles, And as you can see, he invented grunge 40 years before Nirvana even plugged in a guitar. And Nobby is one of the great folk heroes of England because in the 1966 World Cup, which is where basically the swinging 60s, when Britain won the World Cup, England won the World Cup in 1966, it kind of, that was the beginning of the swinging 60s. It was like everything changed. And I can tell you, because everything was horrible and black and white in the 50s, and then all of a sudden it went into color because we won the World Cup, hello. And so Nobby, the son of an undertaker from Manchester, right? The face of austerity Britain. So here is the face of Austerity Britain. And what he's most, the iconic moment when they won the World Cup, Nobby, who had facilitated the win by defanging the legendary Eusebio in the semi final, he took his dentures out. And because you can't play with your dentures in, he would take them out and hand them to somebody and run onto the pitch. And then they gave them back to him. He ended up holding the World Cup in one hand and his dentures in the other. And as you can see, the glasses. So for the Brits, like, he, he became instantly a folk hero because everyone then did have dentures. It was like austerity Britain. Because this is the moment when the, the, the wage cap was like 12 pounds a week for a footballer. Most of them were making a lot less. So they had no money. So all of a sudden the wage cap is lifted and then we get Bobby Moore. Hello. <laughs> Bobby Moore was sort of like, in a way, the, the canary in the coal mine for David Beckham because he wasn't a single guy who was like a crazy hedonist. He was part of a couple. He was actually the captain of the British team that won the World Cup. And Bobby and Tina, they were like this idealized version of a British working class couple. So they really were the canary in the coal mine for Posh and Bex because, you know, people wanted to be them. They were, they, he wasn't just, you know, some crazy hedonist who was driving a car into a brick wall and spending all his money. He was, you know, this super cool, handsome guy. And, he had testicular cancer right before the World Cup, and the wife nursed him in 1965, you know, and then he won the World Cup. He was the captain, and chemotherapy back then was no joke. So um, he was like a really incredible guy who was also the first person. This is about the ancient art of hat modeling. And that's Bobby in the middle. The first one to get these kind of weird modeling, licensing things offered to him, because that just didn't exist before. So here they are hat modeling. I think that's his brother on the right. And um, you would probably know who the other people are. But yeah, I'm pretty sure that's his brother. And then Bobby, you know, when he was playing, he would get a knock on the door at night when he's in a hotel, and this guy from Adidas would come and say, give me your shoes, I'll paint three stripes on them overnight, and they'll dry, and I'll give you five quid. So that's how that licensing thing that now drives 
The soccer world with multi-bazillion dollars, it starts with a knock on the door back in the 60s. Let me paint three stripes on your boots, which is kind of fabulous, really, isn't it? And Bobby used to say, don't give me the money now. I'll let you know. Just, you know, accumulate it and I'll let you know when I need a few quid. There's Bobby with his car, because before that, footballers would ride like rusty bicycles to the match, or they'd go on the bus with the fans. So now they're starting to get, you know, swaggy with the cars. Then, this is the raison d'etre of this entire book, George Best, who was, you know, he was not like Bobby Moore, in that Bobby Moore was a mar you know, married guy, someone you could relate to. This was the fifth Beatle. He was referred to as the fifth Beatle because he was such an integral part of the swinging 60s. Very good looking. Um, he had a shop in Manchester. When I went, this is the year I went to college in Manchester. He had this store there and a groovy car. And he opened a nightclub which was called Slack Alice. I mean, I don't know, it was another time. I don't have an explanation for that. Um, and it was very popular and he would have a champagne fountain and local celebrities would go. And George was super groovy and I have great stories about him in my book. How gorgeous, quick, Johnny, get me my pills. I'm leaving you for the ghost of George Best. Um, he really was incredibly cute, North Irish. And he had this reputation for being missing. Where's George? He's missing. And then he'd say, yeah, I was missing. I was Miss United Kingdom, Miss England, Miss... And that actually is him with Miss United Kingdom. So he was, you know, he, he embarked on this journey that didn't end well for him. And he, he saw himself as a rock star. You know, he was a very much a product of the 60s. Whereas someone like David Beckham, you know, saw himself as a businessman or a brand, you know. So these guys didn't have a sense of that. They just thought, wow, money, I have to have as much fun as possible. And George lived in, in South Manchester with this landlady who kept an eye on him called Mrs. Fullaway. And she would wake him up, shove a cup of tea in his face and make sure he stayed on the straight and narrow, Mrs. Fullaway. And um, then in 1968, he decided, I want to have a groovy house. I should have a groovy pad. So he, he hired this, art this architect called Fraser Crane, <laughs> which is so weird. And Fraser Crane built George this swinging, groovy, white brick modern house in North Bramall in North Manchester. And George moved into this fishbowl and it had all this automatic stuff like a TV that would come out of the floor and automatic drapes. And, and it, you know that Jacques Tati movie, Mon Oncle? It turned into that because the planes, when they went over his house, would activate the automatic mechanisms and the curtains would start flying open and closed and the TV would start going up and down. So his, his friends called it the Kazi, which is like Cockney for toilet, because it was white brick. And he moved out and moved back in with Mrs. Fullaway. And this is Mike Summerby, who you were talking about at the beginning. He was just the grooviest. I mean, can you imagine 1966, he's shoving Ruby Tuesday into a deck in his dashboard. Can we talk? And he, he opened boutique with George. That's them opening their men's boutique. It's completely mad. And Paul Smith, I interviewed him for my book, and he was friends with George back then, and he, he um, had to help him with his boutiques because they were so poorly merchandised, and they were a complete mess. Like being a retailer, it's not, it's not easy. <laughs> so I had to throw this one in. This is completely mad. The, um, in my research and reading old football annuals, a lot of the footballers from this period, they had insane hobbies. Like now, they're so relentlessly focused on making money and getting the underwear deal and being a brand. Back then, they had completely random pastimes. Uh, one footballer from this era was a poodle fancier. 
and another one grew chrysanthemums. And they are these very sort of almost like hobbies that people would have if they were mentally ill, you know, like <laughs> the, these footballers were doing. And then this guy, Maurice Norman, who is a very hard, tough, butch guy from Spurs, Tottenham Hotspur, opened a wool shop <laughs> in Frinton with his wife. So I found this utterly hilarious because it's just so completely non-macho opening a wall. You can imagine what the pensioners going berserk. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> Pele, legend. Um, this barely needs any words. You know, he was one of two footballers who were the, the footballer of the century. And who, you know, the Astros, right? Come played in New York. And very glamorous and always looked great. And the other footballer, who was the footballer of the century, Maradona. And Maradona, this picture is a reminder that this is around the time footballers started to really fiddle with their hair. Hair became a big thing. Oh, you, you're wasting too much time fiddling with your hair. No wonder you're not scoring goals. You know, the managers started to get really concerned with, like, oh, he's fiddling around with his barnet, which is Cockney rhyming slang for hair. Your barnet, barnet hair. Barnet fair hair, da 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 da. So, yes, fiddling around. And he, he had great, beautiful black straight hair, but he had to have a perm. <laughs> and Johan Cruyff, Dutch, mysterious, super glamorous, and uh, he um, invented this thing called total football, and then he became manager of Barcelona. He's just incredible. He died like two years ago from lung cancer. And he used to smoke, you know, come off the pitch, light up a cigarette, which to us seems completely mad, but Johan Cruyff, glamorous. And this is Johan Cruyff when he got married, married this uh, gorgeous lady who I think she must have been looking at the pictures of Sharon Tate when she married Roman Polanski because it's exactly the same hairdo. The, uh, the, that sort of I'm a Victorian doll, ringlets and blah, blah, blah. So, and then Johan, in order to marry her, he had to borrow the money. And it's like it's impossible to manage a wag now, marrying a guy who had borrowed the money for the wedding and blah, blah, blah. But there they are, a lovely couple, and they endured too, just like Bobby and Tina. And here we have one of the most gorgeous cars ever, a Citroen um, Maserati, which uh, is one of my personal favorites. And here is Johan looking very shaft, you know, like buying that, that sort of um, hedonistic 70s look he's getting into. This is um, a player, like from my hometown, Reading. And this guy was called Robin Friday, and he was very unusual. And he was like our sort of rock star player in, in Reading. And he um, was unusual because footballers kind of loathed hippies. Like they thought they were smelly and, you know, they just, it was very anathema. The whole hippie culture, the counterculture thing was very anathema to football culture. So it was very unusual to have a guy with this kind of Eric Clapton, Jeff Beck, rocker kind of look. And he had Cuban heels and flared pants. And he gained some celebrity. And there is somewhere, and I would love to get hold of it, so when he got married, Southern Television filmed him getting married, and he showed up in a white, fluffy Afghan coat. You know, the, remember those Afghan coats? Like snakeskin boots, and, and Southern Television filmed the whole thing. And he sat down and rolled a joint on TV, which is just completely outrageous. And then all the guests got paralytically drunk and stole all the wedding presents. And this is all on films. I'm dying. If anybody knows where that is, I bet you can find it somewhere. Anyway, Robin Friday didn't end well for him either. A lot of these footballers, the lifestyle that they embraced was is the same thing that was happening to musicians. But look at those cheekbones. Um, this is a personal favorite. Frank Worthington played for Leicester and Wolves, I think. He um, 
He was sort of the George Best of the Midlands, if you will. And I love this picture because now footballers are so prissy about their cars. They would never allow the girlfriend to be like clambering on the hood of the, of the, hood of the Lotus, a Lotus. And um, Frank sort of um, loved the movie Midnight Cowboy and he kind of managed to combine the sort of look of Ratso Rizzo with a bit of the John Voight character. And interestingly, you know, a lot of the, the guys today who date those sort of hardcore wags, the wags refer to themselves as lingerie models, which is some bizarre euphemism now. Um, you hear, oh, you know, Cristiano Ronaldo dated la uh, lingerie model, blah, blah, blah. Well, Frank actually did date la real lingerie models because Frank played in Leicester, and Leicester is where all the brassiers were made in England. The, this, all the factories making lingerie were in Leicester. I don't know why, but I find this utterly fascinating. So he actually dated real lingerie models. And um, his book, I highly recommend, find a vintage copy of it, is called One Hump or Two, The Frank Worthington Story. <laughs> that was back when players could, if they were gonna write an autobiography, there was no one supervising it. <laughs> and it's absolutely hilarious. And he also dated Dick Emery's makeup artist, which only English people will find funny, but. Anyway, Frank Worthington, totally great. Swagger. Um, <laughs> Gunter Netzer, like you, Gunter Netzer, German legend, like you look at these pictures and you think, maybe they hadn't invented thinning scissors back then. <laughs> like these guys have so much hair, it's just extraordinary. <laughs> like it's like where the wild things are. <laughs> um, and this is an interesting picture because on the right is Tony Curry. And Tony Curry was involved in a famous incident around this time. We're talking 70s, obviously, Spinal Tap 70s. And Tony Curry collided on the pitch with this other player called Alan Birchnall. They smacked into each other, and then they sat down, and they were sort of friends. They were on opposing teams. They sat down, looked at each other, and gave each other a big kiss right on the mouth. And Britain was absolutely scandalized because this is the era when, you know, Bowie was doing that thing with Mick Ronson's guitar. Um, there's children here, so I won't go into details. But, um, you know, it was, it was a period where people were, you know, um, unisex clothing and things were starting to get very freaky from a gender point of view. So two footballers kissing each other. There are questions about it in the Houses of Parliament. This kiss between that player and another one, they just thought it was funny, you know, that they'd had a tackle and a rumble and then they were like, Mwah, like that. And it, there were questions in the, in the Houses of Parliament about it. Andrea Pirlo. You'll recognize him. He played the New York's NYCFC, right, recently. And um, I put this in there just because, and also because he won an award for his hair while he was at NYCFC, and he won the Best Hair Award. And people said to him, why do you think you won the award? And he said, my hair is the best because it's mine which I thought was very profound. <laughs> He's retired now and um, this is very important. This is uh, early 70s, a uh, West Bromwich Albion. These three black players go to, to West Bromwich Albion. Uh, Laurie Cunningham, Cyril Regis, and Brendan Baston, who's in the middle and he's the one who's still alive. And um, they were called the Three Degrees. You know, and this is back when, before this, there weren't, there weren't um, many black players, or any, I don't think. Like, these were the first. It was like, wow, great. So it was very significant. But back then, um, there was this, the National Front. There was a lot of overt racism that these guys had to deal with. And there was no security. They would arrive at a match. People were yelling at them, spitting at them. And they had to, it was like a Jackie Robinson scenario. They had to just, 
you know, cope with this horrible situation of overt racism. And they were um, also, you know, very much beloved and admired. And uh, their, their books are really incredible. That period of where this weird, it was during the period where there was just rampant hooliganism. So it was that period where there was just awful stuff and some weird tolerance for it. It was terrible. Um, and there is Laurie Cunningham and looking so fly on the, car, on the hood of his Porsche. Note the um, spectator's shoes. And unfortunately, oh yes, he was the first player to go play for Real Madrid. Big deal. So he left the other three degrees and went to uh, play for Real Madrid. And he was, um, uh, he died in a car crash like eight years after this picture was taken. So it's a very sad picture. Um, yes. <laughs> Charlie Nicholas, who was um, really, where is Will Frears here? Because he gave me a great interview in my book all about the impact of Charlie Nicholas on kids in the 80s um, with this asymmetrical hairdo. And he would, he, it was very wham the whole look, which was unusual for footballers. So he had the groovy sound system, the earring, the baggy leather pants, and it was very influential. And um, yeah, she'll re read the little thing about Will Frears, who um, this was hugely in influential for him. And um, he was known for hanging out at Stringfellows. Do you know what Stringfellows? Peter Stringfellow just died last week, so... Um, he was always at Stringfellows, and, and the press would just be banging on about it all the time, seen at Stringfellows again. And finally, in retirement, he, set, he went to set the record straight, and he said, I just, you know, I didn't like Stringfellows that much. I liked Tramp. <laughs> that was the rival disco. Um, Paul Gascoigne, known as Gaza, another folk hero. He... Um, you know, he's one of the great folk heroes, obviously, of British football, and uh, had a very difficult journey. And he, um, his book is incredible. He is constantly peppered with references to clothes, like, I woke up, went out and bought 10 Versace suits in bright colors and dyed my hair silver. Don't know why it seemed like a good idea at the time. Or uh, there was one point where a manager was actually physically throttling him, and he all he remembers about it was that he was wearing this Armani suit at the time. So every horrible remembrance is grounded in what he was wearing. And he did something very sneaky because the managers by this time are really freaking out. The managers constantly trying to control the, be the player's behavior. You know, Ferguson legendarily made. Beckham shave off his mohawk because they, they're constantly trying to keep the lads on the straight and narrow. They're dealing with these young boys who have too much money and too much libido and they're crazy. So Gaza got round it because, you know, he, was, he would say, I am wearing a suit. <laughs> you know, what's wrong with it? It's a suit. So I think he popularized the completely insane suit along with um, Ryan Giggs. He used to do the same thing. I'm going to wear a suit, but it was like that. <laughs> and there he is. I put this picture in because there's Gaza behind Fergie and, um, you know, photo early bit of photo bombing. And Fergie, I have a whole chapter about manager style. Manager style is very interesting. The British managers now, they tend to do a sort of Savile Row bank manager look, which communicates competence, organizational skills, I can handle large sums of money, blah, blah, blah. So they do the Savile Row look. And the European managers do a sort of um, very chic undertaker look, like <laughs> Pep Guardiola. Oh. We'll get to that in a second. But Pep Guardiola, you know, looks like a sort of, um, he looks like a manager, but he looks like the manager of the Prada store. You know, very tight European look, narrow tie, blah, blah, blah. Whereas the Brits still do the old Savile Row bank manager look. This is um, very significant because it's, before David Beckham, footballers were seen as, oh yeah, well you could get him to all advertise aftershave or crisps. You know, because they weren't seen as cool. They were seen as like, 
you never know what's going to come out of their mouth. You know, Gaza got a, a contract to do um, aftershave, Fabergé aftershave, and at the press conference, he was paid a million pounds, which is a fortune. There was a huge amount of media attention, and they said, you know, Paul, so we didn't know you liked aftershave. And he said, oh, I don't. It gives me a rash. <laughs> that was his first comment, and they tore up the contract. So. Beckham is the one who comes along, makes it cool, has his mohawk, and this is when football became cool. The movie, Bend It Like Beckham. So that was sort of a huge shift. And there he is, looking so great. And, well, I think he looks great. And the thing about David Beckham that's so fabulous is that as a young man, he did what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to have fun and wear crazy things and experiment and not care what people think, you know? So there's a lesson for all of us here with David Beckham. So he, look, he's wearing like a diamond cross around his neck and this groovy, probably Dolce & Gabbana caftan. Um, fab couple, adore, the sarong that was heard around the world, and um, wearing a Gautier sarong, you know, like, that was so crazy and unusual for a footballer to wear a sarong with mandals. And um, again, you know, like, he, he did it right. That's what you're supposed to do. Now he has his more signature style. He has his Kent and Kerwin line. It's a little more, he, he sort of found his look. This is, uh, they went to the Gucci store, paid full retail for these outfits and wore them to a Versace opening. <laughs> and uh, which if you have any connection to the fashion world, you'll know that's a bit de trop. But, you know, thank God they pay full retail. They're not like these horrible celebrities wanting discounts all the time. They go pay full retail. So the footballers and their wives are the most genuine patrons of fashion, um, gassing up the uh, Ferrari. Um, at this point, this is um, late 90s, I'd say, he was already, already making like 10 million a year with Brill Cream and Adidas. And, and then he is single-handedly responsible for popularizing ink. So um, I think that's a Chinese inscription, which says something like, everything I have, I owe to um, fate or God or something like that. And I thought, it's actually not true. Well, it might be true, but it's more likely to be his incredible focus and hard work and drive and, you know, always staying incredibly focused and being likable. Frosted tips are coming back, <laughs> definitely. Because you can look at this and say, oh my God, can you believe those frosted tips? This time next year, tr you'll be thinking about it and say, remember that picture of David Beckham? <laughs> the underwear deal. Um, he also, you know, the now on every footballer's bucket list is the underwear deal. And that's sort of a David Beckham thing too. You've got to get the underwear deal. Eric Cantona, great incredible personality, strange enigma, philosopher. He's the, he's the player who, when he was at Manchester, he heard somebody say, he was getting sent off, I think, but he heard somebody say something negative about him. I'm not sure what it was. And he went into the stands and kung fu'd the person <laughs> and went to court and was, he had got 200 days, it was like, yeah, banned for six months, but I think he actually did jail time, too. Yeah. Anyway, he's fabulous, and he's completely uncategorizable. Very, he's not like any other footballer. He's like this pirate that's like kind of terrifying. And uncategorizable, I would also use to describe this sweater. <laughs> and I've been trying to figure out who designed it. If anybody, because somebody did, it's like... But, and somebody bought it. <laughs> There's, he's doing a Couples ad. See, he's very iconic. He does movies now, and, and they, he's got that same very stern, terrifying expression. And um, David Ginola, 
who was the first player to get a L'Oreal ad because he had this incredible hair. Um, played for Spurs, um, incredible hair, and actually, apparently, L'Oreal yanked the contract from Jennifer Aniston and gave it to David Ginola because he was just so gorged with the hair and everything. Sort of like the Fabio of football. This is what I'm talking about, L'Oreal. And this is him last year because Spurs um, are leaving White Hart Lane, their legendary stadium, building a new stadium, and they had all the old players come and do a big sentimental come into the stadium, and he was the only one that arrived filming himself. <laughs> but I think like vanity is, to me, a very life-affirming thing. You know, people who played with George Best said that after training every day, George Best, even just training, George would talcum powder, shampoo, conditioner, and this is in the 60s, for people who didn't even know what that was, um, and primp and comb his hair, and everyone was like mystified, and, and Eamon Dunphy, this player turned writer, said it was as if he was going dancing every day, you know, and I thought, a le another lesson for all of us. You have to approach life as if you're going dancing every day. So vanity, I think it's an important thing for players. Like they have to feel like invincible and crazy and look at themselves in the mirror and get ready to tear onto the pitch. It's a very complex mandate. So in my book, I divide players into different tribes because they do have very different ways of dressing. So there's the psychedelic ninjas, we'll come to a few of those in a moment, like Neymar and completely avant-garde, don't care what the people think. And then at the other end of the spectrum, there are the good taste ambassadors like Thierry Henry. He's a good taste ambassador. Um, Zabi Alonso, Mar um, Alvaro Morata now at Chelsea, he's another one. Like they, they already want to look like they're ready for sort of big boy business opportunities. Um, he's Arsenal's all-time goal scorer, I think, isn't he? Like very, very um, well-known, great, suave. Um, this is Jibril Sisse. And um, this was the outfit he wore when he got married, when he played for Liverpool. and basically upstaging the bride wildly. <laughs> but she got her own back when they separated. She took the kids and herself onto this British show called Britain's Flashiest Families. And like, he found that rather embarrassing. So she did get her own back. And that's him. When you, you know, the, you go to the Givenchy show, the men's show, and you think, who's gonna wear um, the kilt with the stars on it with the matching top? And Jibril Sisse, um, I think he's retired now, is he? Yeah, just about. So he, um, he, he said, I've never gotten home from a shopping trip and thought, oh, I couldn't possibly wear that. <laughs> Another lesson for us all. He's great because he, he is the granddaddy of the psychedelic ninjas. He is the player who will really wear anything totally avant-garde, genius and I mean, imagine the social media blowback you know but not caring which is great more people another lesson for <laughs> <laughs> um, there he's, he has a line of clothing called Monsieur Le Noir he's fabulous French and this is Mario Bolotelli who played for Manchester City, he's Italian. And um, I love this picture because he's, there's this expression many of you who are soccer fans know, it's just handbags. You know, when there's two players on a pitch and they're about to whack each other, they're having some altercation. And then I think, did John Terry create, he was one of the first people I ever heard say it. And they'd come off the pitch and some reporter would say, what was that all about on the pitch where you were like yelling at another player? And John Terry said, it's just handbags, meaning two women that are about to whack each other with handbags, another sexist moment in football. <laughs> so there's Mario Bolotelli, who's really incredible. Like he, um, when he was at Manchester City, he had a Bentley, which he painted camo. 
and which wasn't so great because he was often missing tra training and he'd say, oh, I don't feel well, I'm just going to stay in bed. And then he was driving all around town in a camo painted Bentley and managed to rack up like $10,000 dollars in parking tickets but he has incredible swagger he's great he has he has this tattoo on his chest which is a quote from Genghis Khan that says um, uh, fate must have judged you to be low and s disgusting to have inflicted a horror like me upon you or something like that like it's the most incredible tattoo um, but anyway love him there, oh, there's the camera painted Bentley. <laughs> and that's him with this young lady, Mariella Passani, a self-described lingerie model. And um, the whole WAGS, I have a chapter on WAGS, and it was written mostly before the Me Too movement got going. So it's interesting to read it in the context of that, because what's happened now, Gareth Southgate told the WAGS, yes, you can come to Russia, because they'd been banned, you know, from the previous two World Cups, because they caused such a distraction in 2006. Mario again. Oh. Zlatan with his ink. Um, so the WAGs had caused this terrible distraction. And Gareth Southgate said, yes, you can come. And, but you don't hear anything about it. I think it doesn't fit with the contemporary narrative. Like back in 2006, the idea of these, these girls would say, oh, yeah, I want to marry a footballer so I can just have some kids and go shopping, you know. But now a woman wouldn't say that. So now what you see are Colleen Rooney and um, like Stein Gillibrand, these wags who have professions and they're more serious and they're more entrepreneurial. That sort of brief moment in 2006 when they were like, mm-hmm. You know, they were all in Germany, lolling around the pool, drinking champagne, and, uh, you know, the, pr the, the paparazzi were taking endless pictures of them. There's this famous picture of Victoria Beckham and Abby Clancy and Colleen Rooney and all walking down the street together to go shopping and, it, and the headline in England was Reservoir Wags because they were all in this phalanx. Um, but you don't see that now. I think it's like it, it's expired in which is it was a great moment of fun and frivolity and um, made me wish I'd married a footballer actually. <laughs> this is um, Raul Morales who is another psychedelic ninja um, Portuguese with his wife and they are they're sort of a, a fashion folly a deux that's how I would describe it um, they both have radical ink they both have these road warrior hairdos um, they're in it <laughs> he has something that a lot of footballers have he has these um, he's from Porto I think and he has tattoos of local monuments a lot of them do that which I find quite sweet like um, Aaron Ramsey has tattoos of Caffili Castle on his leg and um, Toby Alderweireld has tattoo of Antwerp Cathedral it's where they're from like so you don't get homesick <laughs> like uh, it'd be like me having a tattoo of the Huntley and Palmer's biscuit factory <laughs> on my back so I didn't get homesick there, um, footballers love the whole koi motif, you know, because it's the koi swims upstream and then reaches the dragon's gate and becomes a dragon. That has immense appeal for footballers. A lot of them have koi. Um, okay, this is the award, the red carpet section. So in the past, when footballers won awards, they looked at it as a, as a reason to get absolutely rat-faced. And the, the number of, when you read all these books about footballers, the euphemisms for getting drunk are incredible. Like bladdered, and, you know, we got completely bladdered on champagne and blah, blah, blah. I have a list of them. The euphem so they would think, they wouldn't think, you know, because they already won, they've already celebrated. So the award ceremony was a, just an excuse to get completely snockered, which is not a euphemism they used. So there's... Lionel Messi willing the Ballon d'Or in his Dolce & Gabbana suit. And there, this year, 
There he is, sitting one seat away from Irina Shaikh, who was dating Cristiano Ronaldo at the time. This suit, I don't think they did a lighting test on it. I mean, it's incredible. Sha flaming Shantong. And um, it caused all this online stuff. Oh, he stole his granny's curtains and blah, blah, blah. And uh, I went in and priced this suit. It was 10,000 um, bucks. So, it's a very sweet picture because, you know, he's a humble guy who is not really into showing off. So there he is stuck in this suit that everyone's taking pictures of. Um, it's very sweet. And um, there's Cristiano Ronaldo just checking the thread count <laughs> on checking the thread count on Messi's Dolce & Gabbana suit. And in the red suit and in this suit, he didn't win. Ronaldo won the Ballon d'Or. So I thought, uh-oh, he's going to like ditch the crazy suits because cause footballers are so suspicious. They're always looking for, you know, superstitious, I should say. Um, there's the, uh, un we're back to underwear again. But um, so then after that, he wore a sort of Downton Abbey tux, and he won again. So I think we, that was another moment, like the WAG moment, like the, the 90s moment that we probably won't see again, because um, every time he wore a really demented suit, he lost to Ronaldo. So Ronaldo is sort of in my group that I call the Label Kings, for obvious reasons. There's pictures on Instagram of him snoozing under Hermes blankets and <laughs> like um, Bolotelli, he's always carrying Louis Vuitton, Louis Vuitton wheelie. And there is Ronaldo with one of his many cars. He has this superb car collection of these supercars. And going back to what I said before, they're very prissy about their cars and they're constantly trading them up and no one's lolling on the front of that, whatever it is, Aventador, um, Lamborghini. And... Um, there's an essay by A. A. Gill all about how when people become very rich, they get this, this, this syndrome called perfection anxiety. So in the old days, players like Georgie Best, they would buy a sports car and they would just beat it to death. You know, the doors would be hanging off, the, <coughs> the rear view mirror would be held on with scotch tape, there'd be blood on the seats. And from, um, but these guys, they, I don't, you wonder if they really enjoy these cars or they're always looking, oh, I have to get the new Ferrari, the new Lamborghini. So the old days, the Frank Worthington days, when you would get one of these incredible cars and just like work it to death, like a much loved leather jacket, you know? So I think um, there's something very poignant about this picture. And, um, this is Memphis Depay with a recent tattoo, and he's not a Leo. I looked him up, he's a Sagittarius. Um, but all this, all this sort of um, tattoos and fashion and haircuts and everything, it's um, a lot of people who are authentic football fans, they don't like it. They think it's sort of jeopardizing the authenticity of football. And, um, I thought we should end on this slide just to remind ourselves that there is still incredible authenticity in the game. This is Tim Howard, beloved American goalkeeper, looking very authentic. So I think the, the, the anxiety about losing authenticity has been translated into sort of a ferocious maintaining of it. You know, local clubs and the gritty realness, it's all still there. You just, it's just that I'm not focusing on it. Um, anyway, so that is my slide presentation. Have I gone on too long? Do we have any time for a Q and A? Are we all right for time? Yeah, that was the last slide. <coughs> I'm choking, it's all the emotion. Oh, what happened to George Best? You said he didn't end um, well. He, he drank himself to death, basically, drink. And it was funny because he was um, a milk drinking anti-alcohol person as a kid, as was his mother. And then in late, later on, it took over. 
And it did with his mother too, and she also died, I think, of alcoholism, so it's very sad. But the airport in Belfast is named George Best Airport. You know, his funeral was huge. He's very beloved. My question isn't really about football. It's about one of the pictures you showed um, of the three degrees. I was wondering, were the three women not their wives, but the singing group, The Three Degrees? Well spotted. They actually were the singing group, The Three Degrees, who had a huge hits and were actually, they're American, I think, but they were very popular in England. Um, yeah, um, no, it's nice to give them a shout out. And they brought their furs, which they ended up, the lads were wearing. So it's a great picture. It looks like they're wearing fur coats. But, yeah, what was their big hit that people, Yes, thank you. One of the three degrees, according to Dawn Brown, had an affair with Prince Charles. I believe it. And Dawn also asked, what's the average salary? Well, I'm very focused on the top salaries, which is like, I think Carlos Tevez was getting $650,000 a week. Um, so like that kind of money is like lottery win money. It can really do a number on your head. You're young. So I'm fascinated by how they contend with these vast sums of money. And Juan Mata of Manchester United, he is the one who stood up recently and said, this is just insane. And he started this charity for players to give, I think it's 2%, something like that. Yeah, of their income, which is a very small amount, but if they all did it, it was, you know, he said he called it a crazy amount, and he was making much less. <coughs> so it's really mad. But there are all these stats that show that the more they're paid, the more goals they score. So I think, or is it, isn't it? Did he? Oh, he's from Argentina, right? Is he? Is he? Yeah. Um, Carlos Tevez, um, he's not going to open a wool shop in Frinton. Um, he's really, really tough. I think he plays for Argentina, and he's, is he in their squad? No. Oh. He's kind of, really? He has a terrible scar here, because when he was a child, he lived, grew up very poor in Argentina, and his mother spilt boiling water all down him in an accident. I see he wears this little towel over his scar a lot of the time. Um, you know, a lot of them have those very challenging backgrounds that I think propel them into this world. And a lot of the ones um, that I discovered in my research have OCD, you know, obsessive compulsive disorders. I think football attracts people with OCD and then it makes them more OCD. Like Tony Adams and Gaza used to sit on the bus comparing their OCD rituals. Like you have to touch this and this and this and, you know, they get... They start out OCD and then they get more OCD. A lot of towel folders in my research. Like even David Beckham, I think, folds towels before he goes to sleep. Don Revy was a towel folder. Um, Gaza, towel folding. Any towel folders here? <laughs> Another question? Oh, there's two, three. Um, the young man in the green sweater. It's a gray sweater. Oh. Come on, man. You're, you're the design guy. Is um, it gray? It's a uh, greeny gray. Don't get mad. Uh, <laughs> okay, okay. It's, a, it's an ambiguous color. I'll give you that. Um, so I have a question on the tattoos. You mentioned themes in your research on the tattoos. And I'm curious. As I'm an athlete, too, so tennis. So we don't have too many tattoos in my sport. But... According to your research on soccer, I guess my question is on the themes of the tattoos in soccer and how that relates to other sports, if you have any thoughts on that. Well, the thing was I started to research the tattoos, like two things struck me. First of all, the, the, the things that they tattoo on themselves would seem like to you or I like the most obvious kind of platitudes, like scar tissue makes you stronger. And those like almost like Instagram moments and for a young footballer these this is the first time they're seeing these things like everything happens for a reason you know they tattoo on themselves and you think god if you're a footballer nothing happens for a reason like everything is completely random and crazy so they they're 
you know, you, you are reminded when you see what they're tattooed is how young they are. Um, a lot of death-themed tattoos. Because, like, if you're a footballer, everything is about death. Like, the, the last World Cup denouement, that must have been a death experience if you're a Brazilian or a Brazilian player. So, you know, being humiliated on the pitch, sent off, and your kids are in the stand, that's a death experience. So there's lots of... Um, death themes, um, that player Agar, he has an entire Danish graveyard tattooed on his back. Um, my, my tattoo chapter is sort of dissects everything in detail because players are now very enigmatic. You don't, you don't really have access to them. It's very hard. Robert in his magazine, he gets to players and actually gets interesting stuff out of them, but it's not easy because they're so managed and they're told, you know, when they do those post-mash conferences, they're not, they don't really say anything. They say as little as possible because everything is taken out of context and thrown onto social media. But their ink, you, if you read the ink, you're going to get more information. So um, there was actually a great article yesterday on the Daily Mail about hand tattoos. That's the thing to look out for at the um, World Cup. A lot of boys have these interesting, like, um, Sergio Ramos has these big flowers here, and yeah. So, but you said tennis doesn't have ink. I would speculate that it's only a matter of time, wouldn't you? Because football didn't either. You know, it happened really quick. So get ready. <laughs> <laughs> Behind the young man in the gray sweater. <laughs> Hey, Simon, I uh, just want to congratulate you on the book, and uh, this has been fascinating and entertaining. So with all the different uh, personalities, all the different footballers that you've gone through, I'm just curious, who's your favorite and why? Um, oh, God, it's really hard to narrow it down to one, but the one I enjoyed getting to know most was probably Frank Worthington, who um, wrote that legendary classic, One Hump or Two. Um, <laughs> Because uh, he just sort of enjoyed it all so much. And uh, actually now Frank Worthington is still alive, but as with Nobby Styles, he has some form of dementia. There's this problem with the players of that generation and subsequent generations because they do headers all the time um, that they're prone to dementia. So this, you know, back then when Frank and Nobby were playing, the leather ball covered in mud and soaking wet was like a, a rock. So a lot of them now have dementia, which is very sad. Uh, they're even thinking of banning headers, but um, the glasses. Uh, thanks, Simon. I want to reiterate that this has just been fantastic, um, really uh, interesting. Oh, thank you. Um, the first thing I wanted to say was actually about George Best, since you mentioned him. One thing I've always loved about him was that quote at the end of his life when he didn't have any money left and they asked him what he'd done with it. And he says, well, I spent a lot of it on booze, women, and fast cars, and the rest of it I just wasted. <laughs> <laughs> That yeah, kind of he it. was a committed hedonist. Yeah. I mean, some <laughs> days when, you know, the players today, don't you get, you long for those old days of right. the hedonism because they're so squeaky clean and they, they have wellness rooms now <laughs> and they, some of them are on special vegan diets and they're very pampered. I think that's why they like ink. They like to look tough and crazy. That's one way they can, right. but I interrupted. You were going to... Yeah. Well, I just was wondering, I mean, Beckham is sort of in a class of his own in terms of the modern players, uh, in terms of style, it seems like. Do you see any current crop of players that are ready to sort of take the baton from him and, to, and kind of be that sort of fashion forward as he was? I think his, he owned that space for such a long time, and now it's sort of spread out over multiple players like... You know, Roberto Firmino, always rocking a new hairdo. Like, so there's a bunch of players who it's spread around a bit, you know, whereas Beckham was sort of, there wasn't really anything much impinging on him. Hi there, in the back, how are you? Hey, Simon, how's it going? Uh, your book was incredible. And one thing I uh, enjoyed about it was uh, I felt like the, the history of soccer style 
uh, it, the history of just soccer in general is very macho, right? Like there's a lot of countries, there's a lot of rampant like homophobia and stuff like that. But I felt like uh, th throughout over time, there's like this uh, this growth of flamboyance that maybe changed the culture uh, to some degree. So did, did you find in your research that you found like that maybe soccer style had an effect on uh, the actual culture uh, for for you know certain countries? Well, I definitely think you know when I was a kid, it was overtly homophobic. You know, when I went to Manchester University, I remember being on the train with this friend of mine, and we were like, great, we can go see George Best play in 1970. And then we realized, oh, no, we can't. That would be like walking into oncoming traffic, you know, because it was so violent and so crazy, and the hooligans had such a complete monopoly on the Stratford end, like you would have just been killed. Um, it wouldn't have been a pleasant experience, at the very least. So now... It's, it's fun, it's great. I just went to a Millwall game with my niece. It was totally a laugh and all the old hooligans are now got gray hair and they're just having a cup of tea. They don't, they're not gonna wallop anybody. So that has changed dramatically. With the homophobia thing, that has also changed. I mean, you don't hear anybody yelling a little bit in England, but not. They wear rainbow laces. They're very aware of it. But it, it, there's a really great book that I read called A Natural by Ross Raisin. It's an Irish name, but it's spelt Raisin. And it's a great book. He's straight, I think. And he wrote this book about a gay football player. And it's a fantastic book because it makes you realize for footballers, soccer players, in, in particular, it's a very complex issue because it's not just that they're homophobic. That would be easy to deal with. It's much more complica complex than that because they have these intense physical relationships with each other that are um, hugging, kissing. You know, no other profession do men like kiss, face, hug, pile on top of each other, naked together all the time. They're very familiar with each other's bits. You know, so they have this this intense physical connection to each other that I don't know, you know, if you were one of those players, it would be hard to figure out how you then navigate, oh, well, he's gay over there, so can we hug him? Can we get in the shower with him? Can we smack him on the ass the way they do? So it's like, it's, a, it's not a simple issue where you can just say, oh, well, they're all homophobic and that's why things are the way they are. Like the reason I think, I think it's a complex issue. You know, obviously there's homophobia, but um, I'm not sure. With, it's interesting because in women's soccer, oh my God, I think 10, there's 10 out lesbians in the team that won the World Cup. So they figured it out. So got to learn from the ladies. So frosted tips are coming back next year. What about the perm? Will that ever reappear? Well, the thing, to, everything that's horrifying always comes back. And that's the, like, you know, like, you know, the man blouses, those blousy shirts. Oh, believe me, they're coming back because we're, everything's a pendulum, you know, oh, short shorts, remember those, those will never come back. Yeah, they'll come back. And the man blouse, remember those satiny football shirts that were like, almost like new romantic pirate outfits? Yeah, those will be back. Because now they've got so ridiculously tight, like um, Paul Merson, who's an Arsenal player and a pundit, he said, it's a good thing I didn't have to wear a tight shirt. My love handles and beer gut would have been like on display. So they've gone very tight. They're going to get loose. Shorts are going to get shorter. Um, the, the World Cup, probably like, you know, they grew beards since the last World Cup. I bet you the hair will be next. It'll be Spinal Tap the next. <laughs> Cyclical. That's part of the fun of it, seeing these changes. Because when I started writing my book, there were very few beards. You started to see a bit of stubble. And then all of a sudden, like 18 months, two years ago, beards. And now Olivier Giroud looks like Dostoevsky, <laughs> or similar. <laughs> Time for one more question. Oh, yes, the young man in the front. Thank you, Simon. It's been delightful, as always. And um, I'm curious to know if you ended up writing the book you set out to write. Um, did I write the book? I. 
Yeah, I did actually because I wanted to write something fun and humorous and um, you know, I listened to all these British podcasts because very much, the, you know, those of you who are British here, the culture of soccer in England and Europe is a humorous culture. Everyone is fair game. And when you listen to those Guardian podcasts, they're just hilarious. Barry Glendening and um, Barney Roney. Barney Roney's book on managers is one of the funniest books I've ever read. I was just crying with laughter about the whole thing. And I thought, I want my book to be funny. Oh, and I'm Maybe I'm giving myself a compliment that I shouldn't be. So I, I think my book's funny, and um, that's what people are saying about it. So that was the book I wanted to read. Stuffed with arcane, bizarre information, but also funny, like loads of info. So you'd read it and walk away thinking, oh, I know a lot more about soccer now. But the most strange, arcane things um, are what I find fascinating. So I think I did. Oh, you know, I would have loved to have gotten more in there about shirts, because football shirts, you saw what happened with Nigeria. You know, that shirt has sold out, the, the World Cup Nigeria shirt, because um, it became this thing on Instagram. It was one of the few very patterned, flamboyant shirts. And what happens now, I wrote a chapter about fans and, and the history of fan style, but I didn't really bring it up to date, where now we have this explosive culture of street style, sports style, fan style, all mixing together. And you have magazines like Associated and Soccer Bible that understand this new culture where the reason that they Nigerian shirts sold out is that it's not like there are 800 million billion Nigerian soccer fans. People like it and they want to wear it with their clothes. So this, this crossover of sports style, soccer style, is, that's the big story in football now. And, and I barely touched on it. What an idiot I am. <laughs> um, but anyway, so thanks. That was so fun. Thank you.